Today we're going to talk about composition. This is definitely pretty different from the usual fare that you see from me in terms of the lessons that I post uh, as articles and whatnot. But composition is an extremely important part of illustration. So that's moving a little bit beyond the uh, basically drawing forms and being able to capture uh, an, a 3D object in space. Composition deals a lot more with two-dimensional uh, shapes than we're usually dealing with. Usually we jump, we try and focus on the 3D. Here we're going to reel it back a bit and try and forget for the next few minutes or whatever about uh, three-dimensional forms and just focus on what you see on the canvas as purely 2D shapes. So we are going to be looking at a few thumbnails that I did. I actually recorded the process of some of these. I would have recorded all of them, but unfortunately the program I was using to record sometimes likes to spit in my face, quite frankly. We're lucky that it's working today. But anyways, these four here at the bottom are the ones that I recorded, and I'll be uploading the process for that with some other uh, tips and commentary uh, separately. Anyways, so first, as I was saying, um, composition is all about 2D shapes. So here you see this setting where you've got lots of depth, you've got things going on in the background. Um, slowly, you can see that these uh, shapes, I guess, or whatever, they're, um, these blocks of space are coming closer to the viewer, and these are even closer, and now you've got something here in the foreground that you can't really see, but it's, it's just kind of poking in to uh, bring the viewer in uh, into the scene. But really, when we're looking at composition, we're just looking at this as shapes. So what we should be seeing are these shapes. And to make it a little clearer, if we get rid of the, draw, uh, the uh, thumbnail sketch itself, this is all we see. It's a bunch of shapes. The way composition works if you were to remove all of the context, all of the specific detail and information, like if you were to ignore the fact that these two shapes here were actually people, and you were to fill it in with all sorts of other detail, the composition would still work. As long as they create these specific shapes and they're laid out in the same way, the composition itself will work, as long as the original composition worked. Nothing has changed. So what's important here is how these shapes are laid out. There's a lot of uh, uh, influence from the general position of things and the kinds of uh, negative space that they might create. Let's see if my brush is working. Yes, it is. So if you look at areas like this, you've got all this negative space here, and it's just as important as the positive space. And the negative space itself is created by the gaps in between your shapes. I'll get more into that later on. A lot of uh, what I hear when people talk about composition is about making your composition interesting. And I find it a little bit more productive to talk about what makes composition boring. One of the major things that will completely ruin a composition is symmetry. Symmetry is boring. It's bland. It's very predictable. It's predictable because everything pretty much stays the same. If you look on one half of your painting, all your shapes are the same as on the other half. So there's no movement, there's no motion. When you have asymmetry, you have change across your piece. One common way of uh, creating symmetry that a lot of beginners tend to do is with their horizon line. So usually what you should do when you're starting a composition is think about where your horizon line sits. And if you remember from, pers from uh, the lessons on perspective that I've uh, discussed before, the horizon line is level with where your eyes are. So in this particular case, we're looking from a bit of a worm's eye view. We are very close to the ground as the viewer. So we're looking, everything is pretty much above us. So we could either be a worm 
or we could be uh, lying on the ground or something like that. And everything seems very grand. If you notice though, you've got, but with this horizon line here, you're splitting your canvas up into two chunks. You've got this, and you've got the space right here. They're not the same size. It's asymmetrical. But if you were to take that horizon line and stick it right down the middle, your composition will start to get a little boring. So let's look at what kind of an impact that would have. Here's a composition with everything vertically symmetrical. I think that's the correct term. But anyways, it's straight down the middle of your frame, that the horizon line is, I mean. And so that means that there's an equal amount of uh, the illustration that's going to be above the viewer's head and an equal amount that's below the viewer's head. Now if we compare that to the two alternatives, this is very similar to the previous shot that I was showing you, where most of what's going on is above the viewer. The viewer is very small. Because of this smallness, you get a sense of being of looking at a very grandiose scene uh, or environment. This immediately conjures a sense of dynamism and movement and action and excitement. It's basically the impression that you are just this tiny little part in a big bustling world around you. The other alternative is having your horizon high. I don't generally like to work this way as you'll see with all my other thumbnails. They're, uh, most of them are closer to the ground because personally I feel that it's easier to relate to because in this case the majority of the world is beneath your eye level. So this means that you're high up in the air or you're at least, you know, most things are going on below you. In some cases, you might call this a bird's eye view, but those are really more terms uh, that relate to three-point perspective where you're actually towering over everything, but it's a similar effect. You get this wide view of everything happening on the ground beneath you. Because of that, you feel, as the viewer, very much in control of the scene. Still, it's a lot more interesting than just a flat, straight scene where you're cut right down the middle and it's more difficult to really relate to it because you don't know, am I, am I a part of this scene? Am I observing this scene? I'm caught in the middle of this and it's kind of awkward and it's stiff. So the first thing to remember, think about where your horizon line is gonna be and never put it right down the middle. And when I say never, obviously I don't actually mean never, ever, ever with a big exclamation mark on the end of it. I mean as a rule of thumb. All the rules are generally made to be broken, but while you're learning and getting used to it, just keep that in mind. So the other thing I wanted to talk about on this particular topic is, oh, here we go, it's about balance. This relates very much to the idea of symmetry and uh, asymmetry. A lot of people will think of balance as meaning, well, symmetry, but that's not quite the case. It's a little bit tough to understand at first, and sometimes I have trouble rem remembering what exactly it means, but you can achieve balance without uh, just keeping everything uh, equally spaced out. Things that are equally spaced out are generally boring. So, here's an example. Uh, here's a seesaw. You've got two equal weights on either side of it. This is balanced. It's also boring. If I put a big weight on this one, 
and a little weight here, it's not balanced. It's going to fall this way. But what I can do to offset that is add another weight here. Not quite as big as this one, but a medium weight. So now we have a small, medium, and big weight. Now, this will more or less balance out with this, but it's not symmetrical. The concept of small, medium, and big, or large, is very important in composition and also in design. They're very uh, easily relatable fields, but we won't get into that right now. You might have heard the, about the rule of thirds. Now, this isn't exactly related to the rule of thirds, but the idea of the number three is one that you'll find often in composition. Here you've got three sizes of things, and the reason that you've got three is because two will be uh, completely symmetrical, and three can be very easily distinguished. So you can have big, and then something small, and something medium, and you know that this is big. You know that this is medium because you might otherwise start interpreting this as big if this one here was more similar to it. This is starting to get a little hard to distinguish. So you're not sure is this, like visually when you look at it very quickly, we're not measuring anything obviously, we're not expecting the viewer to do anything like that, they have a very quick assessment of your composition when they look at it the first time. If they can't quite distinguish, is this big or is it medium, what about this one, then they're going to start to feel a little weird about the balance of your composition. Now obviously compositions won't generally be as simple as this, so let's take a look at one that's a little bit more complicated. So this is one of the thumbnails that I did. And these are basically the shapes that you'll find in it. Let me just frame this out. So there is a whole lot of different shapes here, but you can generally get the sense that you've got the big one here, because it's pretty much the biggest shape on the canvas. Then you've got a lot of small ones like this and this, here, here, maybe a couple of medium ones. And generally what you've got here is a pretty decent balance, just like that. But it's not, it doesn't feel like it's symmetrical because you've got all these different masses arranged completely differently. It's not like you're just, uh, well actually I can go back to the other canvas to give you a better example. It's not like this. This is terrible. It's also an exaggeration. No one's gonna... Well, actually, you know what? Beginners might end up composing a scene like this. Might look a little familiar. Kind of looks like a street with buildings on either side. A sidewalk or whatever. This is straight up boring as hell. It's completely balanced, but it's also just terrible. Going back to that scene, that's not really what we see. We see a lot of different interesting shapes interacting. We see some interesting negative space going on between the characters.
And you've got that all-important distinction between big, medium, medium, and small. So, moving forward from this, the other... Oh, hold on. No, actually, one thing that I will definitely admit in regards to this particular piece is that it doesn't have a whole lot of dynamism. It's a very flat shot. Usually, like if you look at some of the other ones, you've got... Uh, where did my layer go? You've got some angling to it, things are converging. Here, the relationships are fairly flat. A lot of, I've done paintings like this in the past and some people have felt that they were static. The ones that I did beforehand were definitely very stiff. But I don't necessarily feel that a static shot is always a bad thing if you mean to do it intentionally. Here, in this particular shot, I want to focus on the interaction between these two characters. They're having a rather heated conversation. This guy's getting prodded in the chest. So I definitely want to focus on that. I don't want to be dis I don't want the viewer to be distracted by all sorts of um, angular drama and stuff like that. But, of course, I could be wrong. I haven't necessarily been at this all that long, so always take what I tell you with a grain of salt. And most of all, make sure that your decisions are conscious. If you don't have a reason for your particular choices, or if they're not even choices at all, and they're just instinctive behavior or complete happy accidents from your brush, then you need to rethink your approach. Happy accidents are great as long as you can pull out that nugget of gold from them. If you can't, or if you don't even uh, reflect on those happy accidents, then it's not really anything that you're providing to the canvas. You're just scribbling. And that isn't anything of value. So, we looked at um, the basic arrangement of shapes and how to avoid symmetry while maintaining balance. Now, the other major aspect of composition relates to focal points and how the viewer's eye moves around your frame. One thing I want to point out with this one is that I've got a lot of these kinds of barriers. Any sort of hard edge here is going to give your eye, or the viewer's eye, a bit of a tough time when it comes to crossing over it. The eye is actually going to hit that edge and maybe bounce away. So you can use that to keep your viewer's eye from falling off the, uh, the frame. Because gaze really does work that way. If you have a clear path, and your, uh, the eye is being guided along that path and it goes straight off the edge of your illustration, then it ain't coming back. It's a very easy way to make your viewer lose interest. Even if there's a lot of interesting things going on, if the viewer's eye is taken right away from it, consider it lost. So you want to keep it within your frame. Sometimes these kinds of barriers are a little obvious, but in some cases they do work. Like here it's a tent. Contextually, it makes sense, so I decided to, to make use of it. Also, uh, keep in mind that the viewer's eye won't just really bounce away and go somewhere random. The eye likes to follow lines, so always be careful of what kind of lines you're creating. Because lines are essentially, they're not just lines. If you're familiar with uh, geometry and um, uh, somewhat advanced math, I guess. You've got these things called vectors, which are lines with um, direction. They've got an origin and a direction. That's what these lines really are. They're 
direction, their, their signals of motion for the viewer's eye. And the viewer's eye will follow it. So if you hit here, you're going to follow that line, maybe go on to this one, and maybe you'll go right off the page. So maybe this, uh, actually no, in this case, obviously they wouldn't. They'd go here and they'd follow this silhouette. But if this character wasn't here, then maybe they'd go right off the frame and you'd have to reevaluate how is this composition working for you. Of course, the other solution is, instead of letting your viewer's eye just float around without any real purpose, you give them a path to follow. And you do that by setting up focal points. So I'll go over a few techniques for setting up focal points. And remember that each of these techniques is a double-edged sword. While you can use them to create focal points when you want to, if you use them when you don't mean to, you might create focal points that compete and that you never intended to create in the first place. So that's a very easy way to make a very noisy painting that is very difficult to look at because there's just too much going on and the viewer doesn't know where to pay attention. So here's one approach that I've often misused. I use this technique unintentionally to create a lot of focal points that I didn't want and it became quite distracting and that is creating a window or framing something. The window is probably the best metaphor here. If a person sees a window, they naturally want to look through that window. It's giving a subconscious command, look through me and see what there is to be seen. In this case, you see this. And you always want to have a payoff, but we'll get into that later. But in this case, you see these characters here. I've always felt that part of the attraction of the whole window thing is that you get to see a lot of enclosed negative space because a window is basically cutting and creating more spaces. If this was just open and if all you saw was um, like that, it wouldn't be that interesting because you wouldn't have all that many shapes. You just have this big expanse. So you're creating all these sorts of interesting shapes. And, and what exactly is an interesting shape? I'm really not that sure. I actually tried to look it up before making this video, but I honestly don't know, and it might really depend. But frankly, I would say if I was pressed, it's a shape with a lot of little turns and bends and things. That's probably going to be more interesting than this or than this. But I don't really know, so don't quote me on that. Now, another very useful approach to creating a focal point is using contrast. So if we look at this one here, the focal point is pretty obvious. You've got your dark kind of uh, shading going on over here. Got a lot of hard, clean edges. It's that sharpness and that stark and sudden difference in value. You've got some really dark, well, middle dark grays some dark grays here, and then all of a sudden you have this sharp white, or almost white. That is going to create a big focal point here. This is also the reason that I often encourage people when they're applying detail to their drawings not to detail too heavily outside of their intended focal point because detail tends to create a whole lot of contrast. So if I've got these little black dots here, let's get rid of this circle. 
and then maybe we add some white right next to them to make them really busy and noisy. This is immediately going to start distracting you. You're going to try and pay attention here, but your eye is going to kind of wander, jump back here, and then back to here, back and forth in this erratic, uncertain kind of hectic, I don't even know what the word for it is, but it's just not pleasant at all. You don't want to put your viewer through that. You want to give them clear directives. Look here. Look there. This is where I want the story to unfold. You don't want them suddenly looking off into some random space. And a lot of people don't realize that they're doing that because they feel the need to detail the crap out of everything. Because, you know, that whole mentality that rendering something to every fine little detail is what makes a good illustration. No it makes an annoying illustration. And even hyperrealism, which is which can be really impressive to some people and lead them down that path, it doesn't really approach things in that manner. The reason being if you look at the if you look at a photograph of something, <coughs> that photograph will contain unfiltered detail. Unless there's like depth of field and stuff, the area that you're focusing on it's going to be full of detail. And it's not going to discern, you know, where do I want a person, uh, the viewer, to look and whatever. That's up to the photographer, how they take the shot and whatever. But if you just take a plain old shot, there's no such consideration. That's why it tends to be pretty hard to take a beautiful photograph, and that's why it takes a lot of training. But the thing is, when you're looking at the world around you, you are not seeing all that, all that little detail. If you were, you'd be so overwhelmed with information, you wouldn't be able to open your eyes for more than a second before getting a headache. Instead, your brain filters out that information. It decides, okay, what are we going to present to whoever? What are we going to let them see, and what are we just going to cast off aside, make it a little blurry, make it simplified, whatever. And that's why when you're looking at a beautiful vista with your own eyes, you see something absolutely gorgeous that you might not necessarily be able to capture on film. Now, good photographers will know how to do that, or at least they'll know how to do it better. But that's why illustration is still very popular, because they're taking what they see and putting that on, on canvas. They're taking the decisions that the, their brain made for them, and they're incorporating that into what they're showing everyone else, what they're reproducing. Anyways, so the gist of that rant is, don't detail the crap out of everything. A lot of detail is good, but only when you use it for in specific places and for specific purposes. Everything needs to be a conscious decision. I put this detail here because I wanted to draw the viewer's eye. I created this contrast because I wanted to make a focal point. Now, there's one other method of creating, or at least reinforcing, focal points that I want to talk about, and that is those directional lines that we were talking about before. You can use them to lead a viewer's eye, and it doesn't always have to be very obvious. You can have lines... Why isn't this drawn? Oh, there we go. You can have lines coming off of these shapes here, running along this edge, and maybe something like that. And they're all converging around here. Now, of course, you could have been really obvious about it and just had... Remember, these are shapes. You can fill in what occupies those spaces later on, but for now, we're just looking at them as shapes. And 
you can have a really obvious time with this. And sometimes, actually, I don't do this too much, but I did see one artist who made amazing use of this technique. He literally threw in just random arrows. And it's a little subtle, but then you've got this kind of obvious angle coming in here. It's literally an arrow saying, look here, look here, pay attention. I found that very interesting and very unique at the time, and I tried to incorporate it into some of my pieces. Didn't always turn out that well because it's kind of tricky at times to balance the obvious with the subtle, but it's something you can keep in mind. It's all about composition, right? It's all about 2D shapes. The contents of those shapes doesn't matter. So let's just get rid of this mess. So we've talked about focal points, and I explained how those are all about guiding the eye around, or at least giving the eye somewhere to look. Now we're going to talk about actually leading the eye physically from one point to another. Most paintings will have more than one focal point, but there will be an actual hierarchy so that they don't compete with each other. You want to have your main focal point, your secondary, and sometimes your tertiary. I don't usually use three, but it depends on the situation. And these focal points and the way that you lead the viewer between them can have a big impact on how effective your narrative is. If you notice, most of my thumbnails here have some kind of subtle story going on. I don't even know what they are, but when I was painting them, I wanted to create some sort of a story. And I could figure out what that story is later on, but having these figures and, and incorporating them, particular actions and stuff, it starts to get your mind going. So when you actually sit down to turn it into an illustration, you can start developing that. Of course, there's a lot of the time that you're going to have an actual idea that you need to work with. So you'll already know what you want to be incorporating into your thumbnails, but I went into this with a fresh mind. That's why all these are so different. Anyways, one way that I love to deal with uh, leading the eye is very simple. If you see, sorry about that, if you have a character in your scene and they're looking somewhere, sorry, you are going to look where they're looking because you're interested in what they're interested in. These two characters are looking right here. So you're gonna, your, uh, your eye might initially be led to this area here because of all the contrast and the sudden shapes protruding from the uh, from this mass, I guess. But then you might go up here and then all of a sudden, hey, what's she looking at? And you'll go all the way over here. And this tells you a story. This is telling you the story of these two people who are looking at a thing. But there could be a lot more going on than that. And when it comes to telling a story with your illustration, I've always found that it's nice to be subtle, not to overtell, not to explain too hard. Just let the viewer see it for themselves. And if they don't see it, if they capture, if they get some completely different story, well, fine. Uh, an illustration can, it's just one frame that you're trying to use to capture. And people oftentimes will run with it and they'll come up with their own ideas and frankly that's a beautiful thing. Now what I think is important here though is that I mentioned this before there should be a payoff. They need to be look if they're looking somewhere and if they're if your eye is then gonna follow them there needs to be something there you can't just leave your viewer hanging. So if instead it was just, I'm going to throw the balance of my composition off a little bit here, but whatever. Um, here, let's get rid of those arrows. What are they looking at? I mean, what's so interesting over here now? I mean, I, I don't care about what you people are looking at. You, you characters have guided me 
and you led me astray, and I don't appreciate that. That's what's going through your overly dramatic viewer's mind. So give them some sort of payoff. You might be able to see a more interesting uh, example of this, and that's down here. Initially, when I was working on this, I was trying to figure out so... I spent a lot of time on this just to figure out what I was going to put in this space because she's looking straight at it. Beforehand, there was a guy standing there and it just seemed too boring. And it's still pretty boring because I chucked a couple of birds there just to explain the point of that payoff. If there was absolutely nothing here, this illustration would lose its purpose. It's just a girl sitting on a rock. Who gives a damn? Now she's sitting on a rock looking at birds, still boring as hell, but at least there's something going on there. Why is she looking at the birds? Are the birds doing something interesting? What's going on? It makes you ask questions, and that's what I think the most important thing about illustration is. You're trying to tell a story, but more than that, you're trying to get the viewer to ask about the story. You want that viewer to ask you what is going on. I have a bit of an idea of what's going on, but I don't fully understand it, and it's an, it seems like an interesting mystery that I would like to solve. Why do you think that you've got book covers with illustrations? I mean, that's a huge market for freelancers. It's because it draws the people walking by in. What's going on in that scene? Oh, well, if I read the book, I'll find the answer. Now lastly, now this video has been running pretty long, but lastly I want to talk about paths. And it's, at least to me, it seems like a very literal hand-holding way of um, taking your viewer, and that's not a bad thing by any stretch. But in this case, you get a lot of little hints. So if you're if you first start off looking at this big monolithic shape that doesn't necessarily seem like it belongs there, and you got this big line bringing you straight in, now you've got all these tiny little figures, or they might not even be figures, who knows what they are, but they're sticking out of the ground and I'm interested. So I might go down here, follow this little breadcrumb trail, and now I I'm starting to get a sense of what's going on. And I get to this big guy. And at this point, this is where I'm not 100% sure of how the viewer's eye is going to react. Because I can't fully trust my own interpretation of the scene because I'm the one who painted it. I had certain intentions. Not everyone is going to follow exactly how I mean things to be seen. But what I like to think is that the viewer is now going to follow this edge here and go right back to the beginning. They might not. They might flow right off here and that could be a problem so I might want to deal with that. I personally prefer leaving that gap open because if I start closing things off it's gonna look kind of forced. So at least here I have this subtle sort actually you know what they might actually go up here which is something I might want to fix. I might want to obscure that edge with uh, some sort of... hold on. So if I get rid of that directional edge here, I don't necessarily like the look of that, but it's to prove or to make a point. If I do that, then I don't know. But the point is that I want them to go back to the beginning. I want to have a sort of loop. Now there's a more obvious place where this is not done well. And that's down here in this corner. What I have here is I've got this big point of contrast. You've got some real darks here, some real brights here. And then you have this very clear curve. And you go straight off the frame. 
So the, the person who's looking at it might only look at it for a few seconds before their eye goes straight off. And right now, when you're looking at it in this grid, this is a bit of the weakness of having a grid like this when you're working. When you're looking at it, you don't immediately see the problem because I've got this whole thing capping it off right here. That's why you need to come back and reevaluate your compositions. See, well, if I close, if I isolate it from the rest of them, is that is the uh, viewer's eye going to fly off? Where are my risks of that happening? And so on. Now that said, there is a bit of a, um, to be not admired, but appreciated, I guess, about the way this goes. You start off here with this obvious primary focal point, this guy with a random friggin' squirrel on his back, and you're immediately led right up here into this whatever's going on. Is it some sort of a, a, co a coven meeting or whatever? You got this weird relic here. It's another point of interest. So in that sense, you're kind of, you're starting the viewer off at the beginning of your scene, of your story. I mean, it's seen in terms of like a play. And then you lead them to see this. They're not gonna necess they're less likely at least to look here and then look back at this guy because this is kind of a spoiler. So you need to carefully control how your viewer absorbs the information that you're giving them. Even though it's one frame that they see all at the same time, no one can look at an entire piece and digest it all at the same moment. One thing always happens before another. And that's the benefit of that hierarchy. Of course, if you've got two completely separate focal points that are the same, that have the same priority, then you're breaking away from the hierarchy and you're just creating noise. And then the viewer is not going to fully digest anything. So that is my talk on composition for now at least. And I hope to actually take, maybe take one of these uh, thumbnails and start developing it as a full illustration so I can start explaining how I approach things. But like I mentioned before, I will be releasing the process that I recorded for these four thumbnails. I would have done all of them, but unfortunately recording software is not always reliable. Um, and yeah, you can expect that video to have actual commentary. I'll, I'll slow it down at times, speed it up at others, so I can actually poke my head in and explain specific things that are going on. So it should be interesting. Anyways, thanks for watching, and if you are interested in more content like this, then be sure to subscribe to my videos, because I hope to create more of them. Thanks. Bye.